Welcome to Business Pulse Talk Radio, the heartbeat of business. I'm your host, Michael Brett, and Business Pulse is all about business all the time. We're going to be discussing how to start a business, how to grow a business, how to find investors, how to raise capital legally, whether you should be a corporation or an LLC. We're going to be discussing broker-dealers, investment banks, how you attract those elements to your particular business and your offering. And today we're going to be talking about branding your business. How important is branding? Why should you consider it? And why should you worry about it? And I have a very special guest with me today that's done a masterful job at branding his particular business, which is Elite Beverage International, and their uh, flagship product, which is Tequila Commissario. They've done an excellent job of establishing the brand, getting consumer awareness, and the most awarded tequila in the world. And I have the president of the company with me today, a personal friend as well as a client, Luis Cota. Thanks, Luis, for showing up. Michael, good morning. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to see you again. I, this show, we're going to be talking about branding a product. Again, whether it's your tequila product, mm -hmm. whether it's an automobile, whether mm -hmm. it's a coffee mm -hmm. cup or whatever. Now, I, I, I've been involved with uh, you and Steve Rice and uh, Commissario Tequila for a number of years now. I've seen it kind of grow from, uh, you know, a startup to a really mature business in a short period of time. But let's talk about acceptance of the product to the consumer and how you, the steps you took to establish the brand mm -hmm. and kind of, in my mind, set it apart from all the other ultra premium mm -hmm. tequilas mm -hmm. out there to mm -hmm. get acceptance from the consumer and distributors as well as bar owners. Mm -hmm. Well, Michael, we are very blessed indeed to have Tequila Comisario as our flagship brand. And yes, we're a uh, five-year overnight success <laughs> in this business. Uh, my partners, Steve Rice and Rick Darnell, saw the brand at a, uh, an all-star game for the NBA back in, I believe it was like 2012, 2013, something like that. And they, uh, they approached the creator and owner of the brand at the time, and he was at the end of his rope financially. And so we struck a deal with him. And the following couple three years we spend a lot of our time branding or creating awareness for the brand from the point of view in our industry in the, in the wine and spirits world it's all about how do you get consumer acceptance and there's a number of really really important competitions if you will on a global basis whether it's china wine and spirits which is the most reputable in asia whether it's the new york wine and liquor experience whether it's san francisco wine and spirits competition uh wine spectator as a magazine cigar and spirits as a magazine and a number of local events that we've entered across the country to make sure that the brand garnered the right accolades and awards and we've been incredibly blessed that we probably have the most awarded brand in the last five years multiple double goals and to be a double gold you have to have every single judge unanimously say it's the best of the competition 98 points 96 points 98 points on 100 point scale so all those kind of awards gave us a bit of if you will brand awareness in an industry that is still very I guess, for lack of better words, very provincial um, in that people that enjoy fine wine and spirits are very either brand loyal or very status loyal or very award loyal. And in all those respects, we've scored very, very well. So as we've gotten all those awards, we've been able then to use that kind of a marketing um, push, if you will, then to be able to open doors with distributors and key accounts and large retailers and restaurants and bars and those kind of things. Let's let's talk just briefly about the awards uh, process, uh, just so the listeners out there understand. To get double gold, as you've done several mm -hmm, times, mm -hmm. it's not paying for it. Mm -hmm. It's actually having an excellent mm -hmm, product, mm -hmm. and like you stated, the judges mm -hmm. have to be unanimous in their voting for that particular product. So if you could walk just briefly mm -hmm. through that process for our listeners. Well, for example, uh, on the 15th of June, we'll be attending, I think it's our fourth annual Cigar and Spirits um, um, West Coast Wine and Spirits Competition, which will be happening at the Hyatt on Jamboree. And at that competition, they have normally between, I don't know, I'm going to guess five to ten judges on a very anonymous, blind basis. We don't know who they are. They just come up to our to our booth, and they do their actual tasting. They go from company to company, and they may be 
10, 15 different spirits companies there, whether there's half a dozen tequila brands or half a dozen, you know, whiskey brands and whatever it may be. So there's quite a bit of competition. And in our world, I mean, if, if I were to give you the numbers, it would astound you. In Mexico, there are nearly 2,000 tequila brands registered. And there's about 190 distilleries in Mexico. So there's a huge amount of branding competition. So to cut through the clutter, it's really important. So that, that double goal then... Those judges have to make sure that that particular bottle, Comisario Blanco or Comisario Añejo, is the only one of the entire competition that was unanimously selected as the best Añejo by all judges. If one were to choose to choose something else, then we'll no longer get a double goal. They all have to unanimously agree that it's the best product in that competition, in that category. Now, is it is it a blind tasting that they do, or do they, do they actually see your company name Tequila Commissario, do they know the name or are they just tasting it? Blind? Most competitions are blind tastings. Ah, yes, okay. they don't uh, They don't get to see what brand it is. There's no uh, allusion to any kind of, uh, you know, do they like this, do they like that? Do they earn money from this, earn money from that? No, this is totally blind, totally um, uh, non-cash driven, if you will. Mm-hmm. I notice uh, in some of the material I've read about uh, your tequila is 100% agave. Mm-hmm. Um I really didn't know what that meant mm-hmm. until I started, you know, mm-hmm. doing business mm-hmm. with your company and talking to you mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. it. And I'm sure there's a lot of confusion out there with the consumers. I mean, there are so many different tequilas out mm-hmm. there. Um, I never really see on the bottle 100% agave like I've, you know, like on yours. Mm-hmm. Just cover that briefly with us for our listeners. 100% blue agave, which is um, the only agave that can be used for tequila, is native not only to Mexico but also mostly to Jalisco. In Mexico, there are probably over 300 kinds of succulents or agaves. For example, mezcal, which is a little cousin to tequila, can use nine or ten different agaves for their mezcal. In the tequila world, we're only allowed to use 100% blue agave and only from a very, very small growing region within the state of Jalisco and the four states that that abut the Jalisco state. So it's a very limited area, uh, only one type of agave. and much like cognac or much like champagne, it's the only region in the world where you can do that. So it gives it a very unique place to be from, a, better, a very kind of unique uh, sense of land and terroir and, and soil and those kind of things. And so it makes it very interesting in that respect. In the old days, when you and I were in college, many decades ago, <laughs> we, yes. uh, there was something called uh, mixto tequilas, which were 51% agave, and the other 49% could have been distilled spirits, neutral grain, sugar, caramel coloring, you know, it could have been a number of things. And that's what gave us the big headaches back in the, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. Today's world, 100% blue agave tequilas, by law, can have nothing added to them. So not only is it pure fruit that is harvested in a very small selected area from Jalisco, but in terms of the uh, the, the uh, distillation, uh, fermentation, and aging process, is nothing but pure 100% blue agave. The minute it's finished, there are literally every week inspectors in every one of the distilleries, and they put a seal on each barrel and each bottle, so not, not until it's finally finished into the bottle and shipped out, has anybody ever touched it or added anything to it. Now, I notice uh, you do double distillation of your product, mm-hmm. oxygenation for smoothness. Those are kind of some buzzwords. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Explain those, please. Yeah. I guess I'm sort of old-fashioned in that respect, Michael. Many brands in today's world say we are dist- filtered five times, distilled five times, distilled um, ten times. Well, the more you distill or filter a product, the more you take out complexities. And after a while, you've got alcoholic water left. So in our <laughs> world, we believe that just two distillations is enough to get the essence of the alcoholic flavor you want and to still keep the pure essence of fruit. Agave per se, or blue, uh, blue, hundred percent blue ever agave, it's got this very natural kind of earthy, peppery, spicy profile to it. So what you want to do with that is make sure that you maintain it, but kind of tame it, if you will, to a level that it's not overpowering or offensive. So you mentioned oxygenation. After our second distillation, we take that product and we put it into a uh, stainless steel tank for 36 hours and we shoot it full of oxygen. So every little drop gets broken up into a thousand components. And when it gets reconstituted, it's just a little bit creamier, a little bit softer. It still retains that earthy, peppery, spicy flavor we want, but has just a little more elegant flavor to it. So it's not offensive and it's still a world-class tequila. And then when you take that our Blanco tequila, which is the base product, and put it into a barrel, after two months it becomes reposado. After 12 months, it becomes añejo. And the little bit of impact from the barrel, which is a little bit of vanilla, cream, and oak, rounds out uh, with the fruit flavors and makes it a beautifully balanced product with tons of complexities. 
I noticed you used the word fruit. Is the agave, is that considered to be a fruit? Or is that, no. is that a, a technical jargon? That it's more kind of a, a, our industry terminology oh, okay. to talk about the fruit itself. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it looks like a giant pineapple. I mean, when it gets harvested, it's probably the size of this table. It could be 100, 150 pounds. But it, when you take out away all the outside leaves, you look like little spines, and you have just the, the basic inside of the plant left. It looks like a huge, giant pineapple, which then gets quartered and gets cooked and gets fermented and distilled. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have a uh, an eight year old agave coming out, uh, mm-hmm. Extra Añejo. Mm-hmm. Uh, explain that one to us too. Uh, that's going to be an incredible project. Uh, when we picked that agave, it was already eight years old. Then we put it into the barrel for another eight years. So you could say that the project has sixteen years within it. And the idea is to not only to put out a world class product, but to also obviously use it to enhance the brand aura and awareness. We want to make sure that Comisario continues to grow in awareness as an ultra premium the best of the best in the category. And it's going to be, I mean, I've already tasted samples off the barrel. It's incredible, fascinating stuff, number one. Number two, it's going to be put in a 100% crystal bottle, hand polish, and it's a very, imagine a tall version of our bottle with a sash around it, so it's very elegant. Um, it'll probably retail between 800 to 1,000 bucks a bottle, but it's going to deserve that. We're not gonna have maybe 10,000 liters, so that generates about 13,000 bottles. So very limited, very allocated, bottle counted, some signed by the Tequila Master. Uh, maybe some will go to a special events and charities and those kind of things, but I think it's going to be not only a fabulous product to enjoy, but it's going to also help in terms of the, uh, the uh, Comisario branding tremendously. You're listening to Business Pulse Talk Radio, the heart beat of business, and I'm your host, Michael Brett. And I have my guest with me today, Luis Cota. He's the uh, president of uh, Beverage International and their flagship product, which is Tequila Comisario. Now, we've talked about it, your product being ultra premium, mm-hmm. and I notice there are other ones in the marketplace out there mm-hmm. too, Patron mm-hmm. and a few other ones. Mm-hmm. So what are the differences between your ultra premium and Patron and some of the other ones on the market? Well, the industry ranks... Um, the categories by price point. So, for example, if you were to say nine ninety nine to fourteen ninety nine, that would probably be popular price. If you go fifteen ninety nine to twenty four ninety nine, that would be probably premium price. If you go twenty five to thirty four or thirty nine, that'll be you know um, uh, super premium. And then you get to what is called ultra premium, and that's when it gets to forty dollars or over a bottle higher. Now you know, so it's a price. It started as a price uh, segmentation. In today's world, consumers have become very, very good at what they consume and very choosy about what they pick. So you've got to have excellent product in the bottle. So to be ultra premium in our world, you've got to have the best agave fruit. You've got to have the best aging pro- process. You've got to have great packaging, of course. And you've got to be able to show that you're the best of or as good or better than your competition. And in our world, you know, we compete with Don Julio, Herradura, uh, Casa Amigos, Patron, Clase Azul, those kind of brands that are at the very top of the food chain. And there's a few. Each of those brands, including ourselves, as we talk about our extra añejo at a thousand bucks a bottle, we all have a small limited selection of something that is completely out of this world, way above ultra premium, but it's going to be such a limited amount, but it's going to add to that ultra premium awareness of our brands. So being the most awarded tequila in the world really does help set you apart from mm-hmm. some of the other ultra mm-hmm. premium mm-hmm. tequilas on the market out there now is that uh are the awards from in your opinion are they important to the consumer to get them to try your product i mean do the people buy into the fact that well this has got double gold or if they read about it in cigar and spirits magazine mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. you know some other publication that you've won these awards mm-hmm. does that uh influence their uh, uh taste to want to buy your product over somebody else's? I think it does very much so. I mean, you have to earn the award, and you have to earn them in the very reputable competitions, whether it's Wine Spectators, whether it's Whiskey Fest, whether it's San Francisco. There's probably a dozen very reputable competitions. But once you earn that, you have to, as the brand owner, make an effort to make sure that at the point of purchase in your neighborhood's liquor store or you know grocery store or uh, at the local bar where you may have your product being featured on a special cocktail, that you make mention of some of those awards so that at the point of purchase, there's still a correlation between the award you won and what the consumer sees at the point of purchase, whether it's at retail or a restaurant or bar. Mm -hmm. I want to point out that you did bring a bottle of your Mm -hmm. Blanco, Mm -hmm. the white uh, Mm -hmm. tequila. Mm -hmm. And for our viewers out there and and the listeners, Mm -hmm. you know, this is an excellent product Mm -hmm. um, as far as a white tequila. And I believe Cigar and Spirits voted your Blanco 
uh, the number one tequila in the world for margaritas? That's correct. You know, and, and as a consumer, people may not realize that margarita is the number one cocktail in America, has been so for decades. The most consumed cocktail in America, no matter Cosmopolitan's or Moscow Meals, the margaritas are the number one cocktail. And the best, the best margaritas are made with Blanco tequila because by the time you add Cointreau or Sweet and Sour or a couple of limes, you've got so much so many different, you know, fluids in there that uh, añejo reposado can be buried. The blanco is the best expression of pure fruit, so it, it makes the best margarita. So yes, our blanco was bought at the number one uh, margar- blanco for margaritas out of the World Spirits Competition uh, two years ago, I think it was. Yeah, correct. Excellent. Yeah. Mm. So, your recommendation then for people out there that uh, mm-hmm. want to try your product mm-hmm. or other ultra premium mm-hmm. products is. The white is the best for mixing a tequila, but mm-hmm. you really shouldn't on your, your darker ones, like the Anejo, you should really drink that by itself or maybe with a, an ice cube in it yeah. or something like that mm-hmm. to get the full flavor. Yeah, yeah. you know, and it's, it's actually a matter of preference, of course. I think that the Blanco makes the best margarita because it's the most flavorful, and you've got all this complexity of flavors between what you add for Cointreau or Triple Sec or Sweet and Sour plus the Blanco Tequila. A lot of consumers, some consumers like a softer style margarita, so maybe a Reposado then makes it a little bit softer because the oak aging of that reposado makes that fruit flavor just a little more tame so that might be their choice but if you want a full flavor margarita that is very elegant our blanco is without any uh with any competition at all Mm -hmm. and your product is going to be available in some of the costco stores i understand that's correct uh uh, actually we've got a july 7th date for a scheduled bottle signing by uh country music star chris young and then we'll do another one in, uh, in Colorado. And then after that, we'll shortly roll out to Nevada and San Diego through a variety of Costco outlets. So, yeah, that's going to be, uh, I think, a wonderful thing for this summer for us, for our brand. No doubt about it. Excellent. Mm-hmm. And then the T-Mobile uh, Arena in mm-hmm. Las Vegas, Commissario is going to be the uh, premier tequila drink mm-hmm. at 140 events they have uh, mm-hmm. year-round. I understand you signed a contract or get that's ready correct. to execute that. So. T-Mobile is the number one ranked arena in, in the country. And they do the best events. The uh, Las Vegas Golden Knights hockey team was a sensation when their first year won the NHL trophy, so they've become the darlings of the industry. Las Vegas receives like 16 million visitors from all over the world. So for us, it becomes sort of a marketing hub for brand development for ourselves, you know. But uh, T-Mobile Arena is an incredible place. Uh, the, the state of the art in today's arenas is, is amazing. They've got something like over a thousand television screens within it, you know. We will have Comisario in every single bar. Um, Every casino has a suite at the T-Mobile Arena, but on their on their drinks list, the first thing they're going to see is Comisario, no matter what other brands they may carry. So that's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, there will be a Comisario Lounge. There will be a VIP private lounge for our guests and for anybody that, that buys at the correct level when they're in there, of course, so they can buy a ticket to get in there. So, yeah, it's going to be a great thing, not only in terms of potential volume for us, but in terms of the branding awareness for us globally. That's what I was going to mm-hmm. say. You're, you're, uh, how are you building that into your brand yeah. awareness? Mm-hmm. Are you putting it into uh, some of your packaging your design your brochures mm-hmm, i mm-hmm. mean how are you and inc- that sounds like it's very important mm-hmm, as far mm-hmm, as a mm-hmm. brand recognition mm-hmm. how are you incorporating that into your product well ironically enough and, and you've seen some of the things we do and you've been a good advisor to us as we go forward we've been raising money the last couple of years we've really gone out, out of our way to try to be involved with the kind of events nationally or globally that are going to make people understand that we are a brand to be reckoned with for example earlier this year we were part of a uh, super bowl music fest in atlanta at the super bowl we took place in sundance at a supper there we took place in south by southwest in austin texas so we've done a number we as a matter of fact we were the the official tequila of the rock and roll group kiss and their farewell cruise uh late last year so we've done these kind of events partly to get you know, a little bit of brand awareness. Oh, no, part of it is to make sure to show the investment world that we're a brand that we're serious about this and look what we've achieved so far. So I think T-Mobile becomes the ultimate springboard for us to do all of this kind of stuff because it has global recognition. The people that are going to be going there, uh, this weekend, J-Lo is going to be there and she's going to have a bottle of tequila in her hand, for example, <laughs> you know? And then Paul McCartney and Ariana Grande and Elton John. I mean, you name it. It's a who's who of uh, celebrities that are going to be there and the uh, high rollers and the people that spend the money are going be exposed to tequila commissario all night long in every event they've got a two acre site outside called toshiba plaza we'll have a stand there for every event so in today's world when you go to a sporting event people that don't buy tickets they get there before and during and after and watch the game on screens outside they'll be drinking all night long it's a wonderful thing (laughs) good for your product yeah there you go um 
on a retail level, how difficult was it for you mm-hmm. to, I know you, again, we've been talking about branding and how important branding mm-hmm. is for a product. Mm-hmm. So for all of our listeners out there, uh, take note that branding is mm-hmm. uh, important to establish your product. But, you know, how important was it from the, from the retail standpoint to get retail establishments mm-hmm. to want to take another tequila, mm-hmm. even though it's you know, highbrow or mm-hmm. ultra premium? Was it a tough sale for you or was it just a matter of, you know, kind of going in there, show, demonstrating the product, showing them a little bit about it and everything? Just how do you, do you go about doing something like that? A very challenging sale, Michael. I mean, you know, I, I can tell you that I've been in this business four and a half decades, most of them here in Southern California and half of it here in Orange County. I know most buyers personally, whether it's the original wine club or whether it's High Time Wine Cellars or Emilio's up in Lakewood. I know all these buyers. They said, Luis. Good to see you. Another tequila, Luis? Why are you bothering me? You know, <laughs> So it's a challenge. So one of the things we've done, and I kind of alludes back to branding, yes, knowing the key buyers opens doors for us. Uh, tasting the product, it's an incredible experience. They all say, my God, this is great tequila. And they all say, so now what are you going to do to make sure that it moves off the shelf, Luis? And, or to my staff also. I mean, I've hired some people that are very well known in the market also. So, um, you know, one of the things we've done is not only we talked about the branding, the events that we've done, those kind of things. At the local level, we're doing all the things that are very creative. One of our partners is Rick Darnell, retired NBA, ABA player, current president of the Retired Players Association for LA. And for example, just to give you an example of the creativity that it takes, High Time Wine Cellars here in, uh, in Costa Mesa is one of the best wine shops in the Western United States. We're doing a three and a half month promotion where once a month we'll have a celebrity from the NBA come in and do a bottle signing once a month for, for three months. And then the fourth month, we're going to tie in with a local restaurant on PCH in between Tequila Comisario, High Time Wine Cellars, the restaurant, we think Seoul Restaurant perhaps, and ourselves uh, and the NBA celebrities, we're going to do a bottle signing, a tequila dinner, and that kind of thing at the very end. And they're excited about it. They're featuring Tequila Comisario at, at High Time Cellars. So it's a win-win for all of us, but it takes that kind of creativity to stand up from the crowd. Now, on the bottle signing where you have celebrities sign it, um, I'm available. You know, if ah. you if you uh, need an extra mm. one to yeah. fill in for somebody, just... Uh, well. I've got a good pen. Full disclosure here, folks. I'm not sure that I can afford Mike <laughs> Brett. I can afford A.C. Green and Michael Cage. I've even had Bill Russell and Elgin Baylor to our events in the past, which we have. Michael Brett, I'm working on bringing the price down. <laughs> I'll give you a deal. I'll give you a deal. Um, some of the other uh, ultra-premium tequilas out there, um, have, in my business, in the investment banking business, uh, we always refer to an exit strategy mm-hmm. for a business, meaning mm-hmm. is somebody going to come and buy out mm-hmm. the, the business? Or are you going to take it public? You know, what's the ultimate mm-hmm. goal as mm-hmm. far as an exit strategy? Mm-hmm. I noticed some of the other ones, like uh, the, the one for uh, George Clooney, mm-hmm. uh, his tequila sold for, what, uh, $1 billion? Yeah. And then Patron, $5 billion? $5 billion total, yeah. Let's talk about that as far as an exit strategy. Why so much for a, a product like that? You know, Michael, one of the, the good news and bad news. The bad news is I'm falling in love with our project. I love what I'm doing, okay? And we're building this very unique um, tequila brand. And I, I sort of liken it to a fine wine project that's got a very special place that it's from, that it's a state bottle, that it's really like a fine wine. So that's how I'm doing everything because my, my experience from wine covers three decades. So I'm using that model, if you will. But, but more importantly, I think, is that um, uh, what makes it kind of unique is that um, um, the brand itself uh, is going to generate a ton of attention. So the plan for the next two to five years is we would love to go public in probably 18, 24 months and go in public. You know, we had a valuation done last year, about $137 million. We think I'm working on a second one with an outside agency, as you know, and I'm hoping that it'll come in at well over two. So I had planned to, to grow the perceived value of the brand by $100 million a year in sales not actual sales, but perceived value of it, so that in three or four years, we could be, say, we're valued at $300, $400 million, and that at about five year, four to five year, we could then say, we're ready to be considered as an acquisition target, and then we could be worth $350, $400 million. Given the competition that is happening with Casa Amigos and Patron, and given our incredible run-up of awards and accolades and acceptance in the trade, a lot of my partners and investors are saying, gee, Luis, maybe you should be worth half a billion dollars. And <laughs> I'm not sure that I want that kind of pressure upon myself, but I think the reality is that it's a very hot category. It's a wonderful spirit. And, and it's all of the things we've talked about. Also, another thing is that in, in the global spirits market, brown spirits con- 
are dominant, whether it's scotches from Scotland or bourbons and whiskies from America or Japanese whiskies, they dominate the global consumption because brown spirits are very complex. You take the, the raw fruit, whatever it may be, plus the, the barrel aging and makes very complex drinks and very savory to enjoy. I think tequila is going to compete very well in that segment. So the reason the Aja paid a billion dollars they they like Mr. They like Mr. Clooney, and I'm not quite as good looking as he is, <laughs> but they do like him. We're get we're gonna get there. But it's the fact that they can take that little tequila and put it into 180 different countries. Bacardi can take Patron, put it into 180 different countries. In today's world, 85 percent of sales are happening in North America. So the opportunity for tequila globally is tremendous, absolutely tremendous. So if I can just follow those giants and be the little tiny craft small batch tequila and get a one percent share. I'm worth half a billion dollars. <laughs> Excellent. The, uh, let's talk about George Clooney's uh, tequila. For, now, I know he, he got a billion dollars mm-hmm. you know, as a sale price. Uh, and I'm not, I don't want to compare taste or anything mm-hmm. like that, but was it his name recognition that added the value to it? Or was it just that, that whoever bought it thought mm-hmm. that tequila was really worth a billion dollars aside from George Clooney's name being attached to it? I think it's a confluence of all of the above. Um, the category in the last three to five years has just blossomed into into a category that's considered to be a global player. So there's there's the kind of opportunity for that. Number one, uh, number two, the company that acquired it is called Diageo. They are they are the largest wine and spirits company in the world, based in London. They own like you know Crown Royal, Johnny Walker, Guinness Beer, um, uh, Smirnoff Vodka. They own uh, uh, Bailey's Irish. They own a ton of iconic brands, and they've got incredible muscle power and marketing savvy. So they're going to put it all over the world. So to them, it's, it's a good investment. They also legally tied up Mr. Clooney for 10 years of a services contract to make sure that he gets involved <laughs> with the brand for 10 years. So, yeah, it's an expensive gambit, but I think it's a win-win for them. And then based upon that, of course, just like anything else, if you look at the auto business, you know, they may be the Chevy and Ford of the category. I'm going to be the Ferrari of the category. And if I can get my 1% share like Ferrari might have or a half a percent share, you know, it's a good thing. And there's a place for all of us to play in that world. So, yeah, and by the way, to your other question about Casamigos, it is a very different style of ours. Their style is more traditional. Even their packaging is very rustic, old world from from Mexico. Uh, and there's, there, I think their taste profile is a little bit more rustic. It's, it's a little more uh, peppery and spicy than, than ours is. We chose to make a thing that is very elegant and global in appeal. Uh, but that's their choice. That's what they wanted to do. You know. So Are you... I know you have the tequila. You have three different tequilas. Mm-hmm. Are you coming up with any other beverages that you want to handle mm-hmm. under the elite uh, beverage international umbrella very much so as a matter of fact uh, not only are we going to add more sizes to it we're doing the 50 milliliters the little tiny bottles you see in the airlines and in the mini bars hotels those should be out in about 90 days we're doing a, a 1.75 liter which is two and a half times the size of this like the half gallon size we're doing those we're going to have a uh, uh, an extra añejo in the regular line and then the 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 very unique collection, extra you have 16 year old. Um, but on top of that, I'm looking at two mezcals. Mezcal is from Mexico, made with agave, and there's no restrictions with tequila what kind of agave you can use. And it's usually mezcal is um, cooked underground. You know, you, you dig an earthen pit, you cover it with hot rocks and leaves and put the agave. In. And it, when it comes out of there, it's got this really unique smoky flavor into the connoisseur world of spirits. It's, it's a very unique thing. So mezcal is very hot. So we're adding a couple of mezcals. I have a tasting this evening to meet a couple of suppliers from Argentina with some of their beautiful Argentine wines of, uh, of Malbec and Cabernet. So I'm looking at additional wines, a couple of mezcals. Um, and so yeah, we're going to be approached by other spirits, uh, companies, that for, let's say vodka, whiskey, scotch, or whatever, mm-hmm. that they've come up with a certain product and now they need distribution. Are mm-hmm. you getting calls from them to say, hey, can you help us out with distribution? Very much so. Um, not only is the brand making an appearance across the country, we are now into actually four different countries internationally, but my VP of sales and myself have enough connections that people are seeing the job we're doing. And they're calling. I just had a conference call with, uh, with Ireland. Uh, one of the oldest pubs in Ireland is, uh, has released their Irish whiskey, and they've got incredible stocks, hundreds and hundreds of barrels of stocks. So they're interested in us, and we're interested in them. We may do a joint venture where we have a partnership in the brand here in America with an Irish whiskey. Uh, we're doing that. Um, 
there's a group that wants to invest money in us as a company, and they've got a vodka, and uh, they've also got lots of money, so I may take their <laughs> vodka because of their money, although the vodka category a bit scares me a bit because it is, if you were to rank all the categories between vodka and rum and gin and scotch, vodka is the lowest profit category, still very profitable, but the lowest profit. We, tequila, are the highest profit, so vodka scares me because it takes a lot of money to market a vodka brand, and you've got some players like Smirnoff and Kettle One and Tito's and Grey Goose that put millions into marketing, and I'm not sure that I can compete in that world. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Business Pulse Talk Radio, mm -hmm. the heartbeat of business. I'm your host, Michael Brett. We have our special guest with us, my friend and uh, client, uh, Luis Coda. He has a company called Elite Beverage International, mm -hmm. which is tequila commissario. They have three different uh, makes. And we're doing this show live uh, every Tuesday at 10 a.m. here at OC Talk Radio. And if somebody out there would like to appear on our show, if you're a professional, if you're an expert in a particular area, uh, it's, it's, again, I'm not a real big tequila drinker based on my youth when, I, when it was really uh, <laughs> tough to get up the next morning. But I admit that this is... I Imagine what it would feel like to lose everything. Your job, your home, your family, your dignity. This has happened to thousands of the men, women, veterans, and young adults we serve at Working Wardrobes. What do we do to help? We provide career development services, life skills workshops, job skills training. We provide the perfect interview outfit, and we get clients placed in jobs. Call Working Wardrobes, 714-210-2460. Donate, volunteer, invest, hire. I'm Josh Seibert.